Hey guys, Chad here with the Reptile Rangers. Now we're at the Kernersville Reptile Zoo today. We're going to talk about something a little bit different, okay? This is not going to be showing a cool animal or, you know, talking about how great and amazing, uh, you know, a specific reptile is or amphibian is. Now, they're all amazing and this is, this is, this is something a little bit different, um, but it's not quite showcasing one. All right, we're going to talk about... Um, a medical issue today all right as most of you know that know us uh, know that we're a very 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 large medical center I mean we teach vets we teach vet techs we teach zoos we teach science center staff we teach law enforcement officers agencies federal agents we're teaching and doing stuff all over the place uh, but one of our key focuses and one of our biggest uh, functions is a medical center um, anything from simple stuff to major surgery shell repair on turtles that have been hit or injured or whatever the case may be and one of the things that's very very commonly dealt with is RIs known as respiratory infection okay so I want to talk a little bit about respiratory infection today one of the biggest issues that we see is even when a vet that sees exotic animals a lot of the times they go with old school medication or they they don't really have a familiarity with what's going on when it comes to reptiles and most of them don't they're in it for this they see i can make six eight hundred bucks by saying oh it needs blood work it needs x-rays it needs mris it needs all this other stuff fecal samples and all this other blood. and it really is not necessary you know don't pay for another vet's beach house or Mercedes Benz or whatever it is that they want to do just because they're wanting to help with Pharmaceutical America or they're wanting to pad their pockets. Look, there are some really good vets out there, but a lot of these guys either don't have a clue really what they're doing or they're just in it for the money. Okay, so let's talk about respiratory infection today. Respiratory infection is really a simple, basic two things. It's like the common cold or flu in humans. It's a bacteria. And it's also like pneumonia, which is fluid in the lungs, okay? So it's a two-part process. Now, when we talk about respiratory infection, there's two key functions and two key ways that a respiratory infection can occur. One is if you listen to all these Facebook idiot experts out there or go Google and see all the different things uh, that it says you're supposed to do with snakes and with lizards and all this other stuff, then you can obviously get yourself into trouble. Okay, and talking about Google and Facebook, there are some really, really good, knowledgeable people on Facebook. There are. And there's really good information on Google, but you have to be very, very careful, okay? Understand this, that on Searching bearded dragons, let's say, for example, you're going to get hundreds of pages of different information about bearded dragons. It becomes very confusing. All right. And on Facebook, you have some people that just hover Facebook groups just waiting to answer uh, questions for people so they can feel important and look like an expert. There is a big difference between a hobbyist and an expert. There are experts on Facebook and there are experts on Google. There are hobbyist on Facebook and there are people that I did this and it worked. Look, there's nothing wrong and the great thing about Facebook and social media apps is it is a great way for like-minded people to be able to collaborate one with another. Hey, I did this, try this, this, this worked. Um, I did this, try this, this worked. But only do that when science fails. Science doesn't usually fail most of the time. It's not about trial by error with animals. I don't like trial by error, nor should it be trial by error. It should be science. It should be fact. It should be exactly what is supposed to happen with these animals. But sometimes science doesn't always work. And that's when you keep in mind in talking to people in different Facebook groups. And hey, I did this. Oh, they said they did that. Let me give this a try. But bear in mind, it's meant to be a social media app for a reason. It's meant to be able to collaborate one with another and be able to talk to people when you're having issues. Just make sure that you understand who you're talking to and whether they actually have expertise in the field or whether they're just one of these hobbyists that just enjoy what they do or one of these keyboard warriors that's just looking for something to talk about, okay? Now back to respiratory infection. Let's get into the heart of this. One of the old myths, one of the old things that is required or is said is required about keeping, let's say, ball pythons or keeping um, a lot of different species of snakes is humidity. Okay, humidity, yes, is important, but here's the problem. When we as humans create a habitat, we create it the way that we think it looks cool. We don't create it 
to where a lot of the times it's beneficial for the animal. Here's the problem inside of an enclosed space. Let's say we take this enclosed space right here. This is the jungle. Let's say we put it up to 80% humidity. Well, the problem is, is inside of this enclosed space, there's no airflow. In the jungle, whether Amazon, whether the Congo, uh, in the Australian jungles, there is still air movement going through your rainforest regions. There's not still stagnant moist air. Inside of enclosures, 40 gallon tanks, 10 gallon tanks, 55, 75, 125, the only way that you have for air to get in and out is through the lid. Now, when you try and put that 80% humidity inside of an enclosed space where there's no actual airflow to keep that fluid movement, all the animal's doing is breathing in a ton of fluid, which guess what? Is going to go into the lungs. Respiratory infection. Another way that they can catch respiratory infection is through obvious dirty pens, again, too much moisture, and the pens being too cold. If the animal is too cool, even at 80 and 82 degrees sometimes is too cool for certain reptiles and they'll catch a respiratory infection just like that. Take albino Burmese, for example. I love them. I breed them. I've got a bundle of them. But the albinism gene creates a lung defect, which even in pristine conditions can cause a respiratory infection sometimes. Using rack systems, okay? Let's say using rack systems, using these nice um, stackable enclosures like Boa File, Boa Master, Neodesha, you know, any of those. Those are awesome. They work great. But one of the issues that we run into is if you put the wrong kind of water dish in there and they overflow it, guess what you're creating inside of that atmosphere? It is humidity. If they turn their water dish over and you don't clean it fast enough or you don't dry it up fast enough and there's bedding in there or paper towels or nothing at all, guess what you're creating in that warm environment? Now there's a crap load of humidity. That's when the humidity gets all over the, uh, the glass. Now, that can cause a respiratory infection. It can also cause scale rot, but that's for, that's for another issue. Uh, that's for another time. Now, talking about respiratory infection and the causes, remember, too much humidity, respiratory infection. Too cold, respiratory infection. Do your research and make sure you understand exactly what the habitat needs. A lot of the times you're looking 92 to 95 degrees on most stuff on the warm side and 82 to 85 degrees on the cool side. Give them a temperature gradient so they can thermoregulate their body temperature. If they get too hot, then they can go to the cool side. If they get too cool, they can go to the hot side. But this also allows them to be able to keep their, their bodies maintained in proper temperatures so that they don't get sick. Now, when we talk about treatment in reptiles, vets, old to old go-to, I'm telling you, the old go-to, all they do is walk around the corner and they look in this book and this book says you need to use Batril. Batril is one of the worst things that you can give to a snake anymore uh, or, or a reptile. I mean, for one, it wasn't meant for it, but nothing we give to reptiles was really meant for reptiles. Th understand this. We're just now starting to, to tap into the vastness of the scientific possibility when it comes to dealing with and treating reptiles. It is amazing the discoveries that we're finding and the treatment methods that we're, that we're coming up with. Us and other, other facilities, zoos and science centers and, and laboratories and vets uh, and vet schools. I mean, there's just so much that's being created and discovered when it comes to these animals. However, Batril, absolutely horrendous. Number one reason is because they can grow an immunity to it very quickly. If the snake does not get rid of the respiratory infection and it's just treated over and over and over with Batril, it's going to become immune to it and it'll, it'll never treat it again. Now, it is a sub-Q injection is one of the things that it's called, meaning it goes just under the skin. The problem with that and number two reason why it's a horrible one is because it can actually cause blistering underneath the skin or necrosis, which you put too much in there or you don't do it right and then it creates that blister. That blister all of a sudden it becomes a hard scab, it falls off and now you have this gaping wound that you now have to deal with thanks to that drug. Okay. One of the better ones to use that if a, a, the, the actual experienced vets that, that do know what they're doing, do know how to treat these animals in the proper way, uh, as long as it doesn't cost you a fortune, um, is ceftazidine or Fortas. Now, I'm not going to get into how to treat these animals because I'm not, gonna, I'm not at all going to open up for somebody to say, oh, well, you said do this. No, I'm not telling you how to treat that. You need to seek professional 
uh, advice and professional help, whether through us, whether through whoever it is that you trust. Now, I've seen Thailand at Tractor Supply work 10 times better than Batrol would work. Um, and all those are what they call IM or intermuscular injections. It goes into the muscle that way it disperses like it's supposed to. I've also seen people, you can look it up on YouTube, you can look it up on, uh, I'm sure there's plenty of these Facebook warriors, uh, all these Facebook experts um, that talk about um, using Vicks Vapor Rub, uh, things like that. You can, and I've, I've heard of that being used successfully. I'm not going to tell you how to do it, nor would I dare to. Um, for again, this is something that you would just have to make your own decision if you were going to do this or seek professional advice. Now, Vicks Vapor Rub has been, has been utilized to work. One of the best ways of doing it in an early respiratory infection is just simply cooking it out. Now, here's the old school mentality. Up the temperature, up the humidity. Really? If it's already got fluid in the lungs, you really want to add more to it? No, you don't up the humidity, you do up the temperature. And that's only in the early stages because ultimately what you're trying to do is you're trying to dry their lungs out. You give them access to water, obviously, so they don't dehydrate. But one of the easiest things to do is drying them out, just trying to dry those lungs up, trying to get the fluid to be less inside of their lungs because when the signs and symptoms are holding their head up, opening their mouth up, breathing, it's kind of like us when we tilt somebody's head back to give CPR, we're opening the trachea, we're opening the airway. What they're trying to do is they're trying to open their airway. They're trying to be able to get air into their lungs. That's why they hold their head up and open their mouth. They can breathe around that fluid or that phlegm. Remember that this is bacteria and fluid, so it's a two-part process. But if you ultimately dry out the fluid, then you can kill down the bacteria. Now, does that mean the bacteria may be laying there dormant? Absolutely, it is very possible, because if you don't treat with the antibiotics, then you may not take care of the bacteria. But unlike pharmaceutical America or a lot of veterinary practices, stuff like that, we don't want to just go with drugs right out of the gate because we want the animal's body to fight it itself. Keep it through nutritional supplementation, through nutritional treatment, keeping nutrition going in the animal's body, and keeping a good food content going. That way the animal is able to fight it off itself and then with the proper habitat. I want you to understand this. I had a vet in, vet in here the other day that we were, and we were just talking about it. She said the exact same thing. 90% of the time when you have an issue with a reptile, it is habitat related. It is ecosystem related. Something is just off a little bit inside of your ecosystem. Now, understand, understand. I'm not giving you advice on trying to treat this, not through this kind of a video. What we want to do is we want to bring aware the realities of respiratory infection. Something that's just simple, if you can tweak things maybe in your habitat or you can make sure that your habitat is set up correctly, make sure the temperatures are correct, make sure you don't have too much humidity. A water dish big enough that these animals can soak in and especially with snakes, they will go into it. 75% of the time and when it's time for them to shed then they can shed out. If you want to give them a little humidity during shed during the shed cycle, um, it's seven days, seven to ten days, okay? Seven days that their eyes are in blue, that they're cloudy and then after that seven days you got about three to five days after that when they clear up just a little bit and then they're going to be shedding. Those three to five days if you want to soak it, if you want to spray it, then go for it, do so. But over humidifying these animals all the time can be really bad because moist bedding causes scale rot. Too much humidity in the air is going to cause respiratory infection. There's a lot of disadvantages other than for amphibian species, chameleons can, can handle it, even chameleons um, can actually get a respiratory infection from being too fogged or too misted, uh, like a misting system or a fogger system when there's just too much of that in the air. So be very, very mindful of how you do that. This is respiratory infection. This is an overview on symptoms, on causes, on not necessarily how to treat it, but ways that they are treated. Because remember, we're not going to tell you over a video how to treat it, how to treat that animal. That is not something that is that should be done ever. Uh, that should be done either by being the animal being seen by a vet, by a, a rehab center, by somebody that knows what they're doing and can give you the proper advice and take the time to spend with you. But this is also letting you know exactly how environments 
should potentially be. Now, there's so many different reptilian species, so many different temperatures, so many different uh, humidity gradients, so many different ecosystems that it's obviously not going to be perfect or or easy. It's not going to be easy to just explain all the ecosystems in one respiratory infection video. But do your research on the exact animal that you have and know what it's supposed to be. And also remember, when you have enclosed glass containers or enclosed stackable units, uh, you got to think about that too. The humidity level is going to be higher and it's also not going to be as much airflow, so you want to make sure that you monitor exactly how that goes. That's why you see a lot of ball python breeders, a lot of these breeders are constantly changing their paper towels out day after day because, yes, too much water is a bad thing. Okay. Now, this is Chad with the Reptile Rangers at the Kernersville Reptile Zoo. We hope this has been helpful. Feel free to get in touch with us if you have any questions. So go check out that YouTube channel. Hit that subscribe button. Let us know what you want to see medical ecosystems, housing, whatever it is when it comes to reptiles or amphibians. We're always putting new videos up, so now we'll either see you at the Kernersville Reptile Zoo or we'll see you on the next episode. Later.